really cold in Texas terms today. Um, so we will um, in this in the, the next in the this section we have Giulio Minniti and uh, Miriam Wenling. Uh, so we will start with Giulio's paper. Uh, Giulio Minniti is a PhD student at Harvard University about to complete a dissertation on the origins of Benevento notation under the guidance of Thomas Forrest Kelly. Uh, his effort aims at contextualizing the appearance of this, this script in the larger history of early notation and we expect to have papers last for about 20 minutes plus 10 minute discussion. So let's welcome Giulio with a silent applause. <laughs> Thank you, Luisa. Um, okay, so um, I guess let me share the screen and I hope I can make it on my first attempt. I'm usually quite bad at sharing screens. But let's see what happens. So can you see uh, many scripts and stuff? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, in my paper, I'm going to present you some cases. So it's going to be it's going to be both a some sort of historiographic um, account of how uh, rhythm in later manuscripts has been uh, spoken of, um, but at the same time. Uh, I'm also going to uh, describe changes happening in later manuscripts, uh, later sources of Benevento notation as time goes on. Um, I chose this image here because on the background you can see a quite later uh, source of Benevento notation, one that would be allegedly lacking uh, rhythmic features because there's these um, all too simple, all too hasty uh, equation of later manuscripts uh, equaling lack of uh, rhythmic nuance. While this is definitely, while there's definitely some truth in that, uh, I also feel it has to be better contextual. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it seems that a few people, I can see your screen, but I see a few people don't see your screen. So maybe there is some technical issue that needs to wow. be resolved. Uh, um, does everybody see Julio's screen? Maybe you can just put a thumb up in the ch in the in the reactions because I saw a few comments in the chat. Okay, so do you think it's okay? Before? Yeah, there are people that are seeing it. Okay, okay. sure. Uh -huh. So I think it should be fine. Okay, uh, I'm glad it wasn't mine. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I mean, you, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, there's this equation going on in, especially earlier um, musicology, uh, like from more than twenty years ago, which is still the most um, describing uh, Benevento notation. Um, there's this equation of later sources. Um, being equal to uh, uh, wars, um, like they, they reporting wars, all the nuances of Gregorian chant. And, uh, and again, I'm going to uh, delve more into that um, through my paper. So I think this is a um, pretty telling um, image of what I'm speaking about. Here we have on the top uh, a manuscript from Switzerland uh, written around 980, around turn of 11th century. That's uh, allegedly full of rhythmic nuance and on the bottom um, a much later, possibly 13th century, that's not been dated, manuscript from the Dominican Abbey of Swetel in Austria. Um, and so the, the usual recounting of notation history will go that the, the top source is, is, written, is full of rhythmic nuance while the one on the bottom lacks such rhythmic finesse. But things are not so black and white because if we, uh, if we um, 
look at a contemporary manuscript of the one on the top, I'll be uh, 44 um, from the southern region of Aquitania, France. Um, we see that even this one is uh, the one now in the middle lacks much of the detail that the um, upper source has, although they're more or less contemporary. Uh, so it's clear that it's not so, the divide between rhythmic finesse or lacking of that is not so uh, straightforward. Um, it mostly goes, and this is one of my main theses that I discuss in my dissertation, it's mostly a matter of what the neomaters aim to uh, communicate to their uh, users. Um, and here there's a table of uh, five different sources of Panaventa notation, all uh, notating the same piece, which is quite lucky, I think. I have never been able to trace one single piece in more than five sources. Um, so this, this is as much as I can go on this single uh, pneumatic script uh, for a single, for, for a unique uh, piece of music. Um, the, uh, the sources shown here are all the way from possibly late 10th century to possibly mid 12th century. Um, uh, and there's already, already you can see that there are um, different attitudes and it is true that as time goes on and the sources go down on the bottom of the screen, there seems to apparently be um, progressive decay in rhythmic notation, in the notation of rhythmic nuance. And I'll expand more on this later because it's again not as uh, black and white as it seems on um, first looks. Uh, the way um, previous scholarship has um, studied uh, rhythm in Benevento notation was usually just um, this again another example of the same piece in five different sources. Uh, numbers on the right are my own reference for the um, uh, what manuscripts they for the date from. Um, and these show very well how past commentators um, were working on issues of rhythm in Benevento notation. Uh, they mostly were noting that later sources tend to uh, drop requestances, which is somehow true. It's not as drastic as um, past commentators have said. And when I say past commentators, I pretty much prefer to the Solesm school, and especially the 15th uh, volume of Paleography Musical, which is still the largest, um, this, which still has the largest discussion, I mean, the largest essay uh, on Benevento notation at large. Then another matter that is, that is found everywhere is the uh, disappearance of Quilisma, which again, this is, pretty much true, there's not much to, to be said about it. it. It disappears around the second half of the 12th century, and that's about it. I mean, this is something that actually happens. And, uh, and then my favorite, for sure, is discussion of epizema, which solemn scholars had completely wrong. Um, uh, the matter being that they uh, took Benevento 33, this source here, as the standard for the usage of epistema in, uh, in Benevento notation at large. But this is a hugely idiosyncratic manuscript when it comes to the use of epistema. So in no way it can account for the way, for how epistema works in, uh, in Benevento notation. Um, actually, I've only been able to find four rhythmic specific shapes in Benevento notation, which are these ones. Um, these four ones, this kind of J uh, that um, translates what again Solesm scholars have called an initio debilis. Uh, same going for the loop, torculus, rounder one, it's an initio debilis. Um, then there's an actual epistema that cannot be uh, taken for wrong because it modifies the shape of the uh, of the neum itself. Uh, so there can be no doubt that this is an actual epistema, while there are doubts uh, when there's this little nibble uh, uh, on the top of another new. But this is um, 
this is surely an episema. So this is one of the four cases that alter the rhythm of standard shapes. And then the last one is the cadential torculus that looks somehow like a uh, Cyrillic N. Um, in this table, uh, there are examples of how these four uh, rhythmic specific shapes um, work in the wild of uh, Beneventer notation. Uh, um, the example on the left has three of those four cases and that on the left, on the right has the remaining fourth. Uh, I was pretty lucky to find three of, three out of four in just like um, this little music, it's very compact. Um, and again, when seeing it on, in the light of uh, later sources, um, we do see that there's a tendency to uh, lose these details. The only one in the um, in this specific case, the only one that's preserved is the uh, cadential torculus, which is found in all five sources. While both the edisema um, and the um, J-shaped cleavis are dropped and, and substituted with standard shapes. Um, and same goes with the lupitorculus that is abandoned in later shapes. And I will uh, come back on why that happens uh, later, uh, in later sources. I mean, why these loopy rounder shapes are lost through, um, as time goes on. Um, so those four shapes are the only one that I can safely assume um, specify rhythm every time I see them. Um, then there's the matter of um, how to notate ascending and descending movements. These ones are the standard options. So a connected um, wavy sign and three um, elements with the first one changing uh, in regard to the direction. Then there's the possibility of having all of them in chain, which is a characteristic of Benevento notation. And then there are other options, like having broken ascents like this, or like this, or like this, and different elements in this sense, like this, or um, uh, like this. Um, so the questions are, uh, do these various options convey rhythm, the, the ones on the bottom? And uh, is this variety kept in later sources of Benevent annotation? In this example, um, I find that uh, of the two uh, sources of Benevent annotation on the top, um, the, the one with the newer notational style uh, keeps uh, united what the one with earlier notational style keeps separated. And same happens with later uh, manuscripts. Again, they connect what the uh, earliest style manuscript keeps separated. Um, uh, and I will go a bit quicker now. Um, so this, this was what happens when I deal with the ascending movements. Um, descending movements, it's pretty much the same. We have the standard shape, which is this one, and the broader shape, which is this one, kind of. Um, and, uh, this one, I also am always sure that reflects a broader movement, but it's very seldomly found in later sources. Again, you see that when the earliest style manuscript has a uh, broader shape, later ones either uh, merge this neum, as in here, or they use the standard shape, which is this one, like here, here, and here. Um, and even uh, a even more fascinating matter is that later sources tend to merge together elements that uh, earlier ones keep separated again here. It's I know it's it's hard to see. I've been spending the last five years of my life on this stuff, so I kind of developed an eye for it. Um, I don't think there's time, or maybe just very briefly discussing this table. Um, this shows how even a rather early source like Benevento 33, which is around the, uh, say, year 1000, it uses different final elements in a descent here and here, 
notating twice the same melody. So this is a melody that's the same uh, recurring at the end of the response of a gradual and at the verse. The melody is exactly the same and um, and this source here noted it's twise with different final elements. Um, I think uh, this is exceptional, but in no way the use of uh, a this line as the final element of a descent um, is keeps the same every time it's used. So it, I think it's something just saying the last sound is exceptional, but not much specifying uh, in what way it is exceptional because then we find the same final mark for a descending um, movement, even in this context. So the context on the left is very light. I'm sorry for drawing letters very awkwardly. And one on the right is very broad. And, uh, and they both use the final element uh, with a um, mark. Uh, so there's some inconsistency in this. Um, what instead is kept throughout all the ages of Benevento notation being a very loud exception is pneumatic separation, which is also most commonly known as Kapoor. Kapoor is the only uh, device to notate rhythmic nuance that is actually always kept through the whole history of Benevento notation from the earliest all the way to the latest sources. Um, it is generally understood that something um, that specifies a broader articulation, although this is always a hazy definition. I mean, we don't know much about rhythm of Gregor and Chant, so this is all speculatory. But it, it is true that Kapoor marks articulation points. Um, uh, and again, it's always uh, kept in later sources. There's four examples here. I will just highlight possibly what's easiest to see, which is in the middle of um, two and three. Here's the Kapoor, and Kapoor is found here, 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 and here. So all the sources uh, do respect this indication, which is the clearest in St. Gall notation that's on top here. Um, I've analyzed how many um, Kapoor occurrences happen in uh, five, six Benevento manuscripts, putting them against the occurrences in St. Gall notation, which, which is, of course, the musical script where Kapoor has been most uh, studied. And uh, the exact agreement of Kapoor, which is 85% across all early sources, and 80, 70% across later ones. But these numbers, they rise uh, all the way to 90, 95% when uh, Pressus is added in as an adaptation, a Benevento adaptation of Kapoor on the, on the unison. I know it's getting technical here and I apologize for that. Um, but the point is that many occurrences of Kapoor in St. Gall notation are turned into Pressus in Benevento notation, which is also why Benevento notation looks, I mean, it's really characteristic. It gives the looks, um, if any of you as kind of like the inside view of later Benevento notation and how it appears, uh, he or she would know that it's very rich of, uh, in, uh, in Pressus. And the reason why is because it merges, it uses pressus um, where other meditational families would use a kupur on the unison. Um, and if we can get to the conclusion, because it's 9.55. Yeah, so this is the, only, the, the last slide um, of my presentation. And, um, and I would like to discuss, um, like find the different schemes. Um, again, on the earliest source, there's um, disgregated ascending movement, later ones have um, um, conjunct shapes. Then there's um, liquescencies they found everywhere, uh, which is kind of clashing with what um, um, earlier scholars would have said about uh, the nature of Benevento notation. So coming to the true conclusions, I would say that uh, Benevento notation does acknowledge and employ all the rhythmic tools that have 
been used in earlier uh, notational families and scripts, uh, but their adaptation is kind of lost as time proceeds. So it's not true that um, they don't know how to uh, notate these finer rhythmic ones, it's just that they don't need to anymore. Uh, and it's not because, again, they start losing best references of earlier manuscripts and other notational families. It's just that rhythmic precision was not very high on the agenda of Benevent and Numators. Uh, what was really paramount for them was the uh, precision of notating the melody itself, like the diastemacy of uh, their notation. And it's pretty pretty evident even from the very earliest sources of the late 10th century, um, the great, the exactness of the thematic precision. Um, so they, they clearly felt that the estimacy was more important than rhythm. And, uh, and I think getting a little broader on, the, uh, on what this evidence means, uh, I think that when we put this together with the fact that Aquitanian and the non tonal musical scripts, which are also later 10th century, 11th century musical scripts, um, follow the same path. Uh, I think there's a clear trend going on. Um, so there must have been something like a second wave of musical notation, as I call it, but I hate the wording, um, that came after like 150 years, maybe after the first wave of Carolingian times. Um, and this second wave definitely focused more on uh, delivering melodic precision than rhythmic. Um, so I think this tells of how the needs for writing music changed in the stretch of a century and a half. Um, precision on melody rather than rhythm wasn't, was not a consequence of later sources of one single script, but was something inherent and seminal from the very beginning of, in my case, Beneventan script, but I think this can really be um, opened and the same can be said for Aquitanian and Anantor notation. Um, and I, again, I think that that is a interesting trend to see from the very beginning rather than going to the 13th, 14th century where things are pretty much all so evident that they don't require much discussion at all. And I think I can say I'm done. Sorry for being one minute and 30 seconds later, but thank you. Well, well, thank you so much for this uh, examination of uh, many different versions of uh, uh, the same melodic passages. So, um, and I see, you know, uh, applauses in the, in the um, uh, reactions in the, in, on the screen. So are there any questions? We are uh, allowing questions like uh, up until the hour 05 for this paper, because we started five minutes late. So are there any questions? Please raise your hands or, and if you can stop share screen, Julio, so that we can yeah. see. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I see Tom Kelly's raised hand. <laughs> Hi, Tom, wherever you are. Hi, Luisa. Hi, Julio. Hi, um, this is great. I've been, I've been following Julio quite closely in all of this, and it's fascinating. Uh, but I'm not sure I, I heard you until this moment say a date for sort of the creation or the devising of Benevent and Chant. You say 150 years maybe after the first wave. So what would, what would then be your rough date for the creation or devising or whatever it is of Beneventan notation and its sister notations? Um, well, I mean, as both you and I know, the earliest source, datable source of Beneventan notation dates 949. Uh, there I think some of the earliest sources point even earlier than that, but we can't tell for sure. Um, it's clear though that that system must have been going on for some time before 949 because the 949 source is so very clearly defined as Benevent and there's nothing, um, there's nothing uh, experimental about that. Uh, 
connecting this, which is much more fascinating than just being plain, com I mean, um, comparing plain tables. Um, I think it's much more fascinating to throw in some larger cultural um, discussion as well. And so when I get to read um, from that, the Beneventan textual script um, from Lowe's book was standardized and spread throughout the Beneventan area by around 900, uh, then it's reasonable for me to think that by that time they had to have a way to notate music just as they had a unique way of writing text. It's just that being much rarer the need of writing music than writing text, uh, those sources might have not um, survived. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I will tentatively stretch the very first experiments in Benevento notation to around the year, years 900. Uh, so about 30, 40 uh, years at least earlier than the earliest datable source of 949. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> There's a question from Barbara Hag in the chat. Um, and are any changes in pronunciation that might have affected the changes? And if I can uh, sure. connect with this question, uh, I mean, having spent many, many hours, maybe years, decades of my life uh, transcribing prosulas, uh, I am totally convinced that, you know, especially in the use of special neumes, uh, whether if it's, I mean, speaking of syllabic genres, uh, uh, whether it's uh, liquescences or um, 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 or discourses and et cetera, et cetera, there is a very strong connection with the prosody and pronunciation of the text, but uh, I turn the question to you. So, no, 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 no. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the, um, I think one of the reasons why Celeste commentators have said that later sources lack liquescences is actually because they didn't look at syllabic genres such as prosule, tropes, and so on. Um, because while it is somehow true that the uh, like mass proper pieces, the um, questions tend to decrease in usage in later times. They absolutely never cease to be uh, present when it comes to syllabic channels. Um, so the, the, there might have been reasons for the diminishing use in uh, introits, graduals, and so forth. Uh, but the fact that they were just as used, if not even more, I didn't get to count all of them, I might, uh, but the fact that the questions are used just as much, if not more, when it comes to syllabic channels in later sources, um, I think that tells more of how important they were um, held in the in the minds of Benevento numerators. And when it comes to later sources, I mean, uh, we also should keep in mind that, for instance, a manuscript like Benevento 35, which is a total mess, uh, I mean, with so many mistakes and th problematic things, but uh, A, I mean, there are multiple scribes, so you see different attitudes on the part of the different scribes, and plus, in some of the sections, the, the pneumatic variety, pneumatic variety is uh, incredible. So it's re, I mean, it's one of the richest manuscripts in, in terms of um, uh, pneumatic um, uh, variety um, than even early, other earlier manuscripts. So it's really very much a matter of contextualizing. Oh yeah. You know, just manuscript by manuscript, piece by piece, uh, uh, the, uh, style by style, but also scribe by scribe within the same manuscript. But uh, there is another question from Ellen. Uh, she didn't type it, so very, very briefly, maybe. Yes, I hope I can make it briefly, thank you. Um, would you perhaps um, make up a line from first, very roughly, first using manuscripts rather for a smaller circle of Chan communities? Therefore, the how you have to produce it, how you have to sing, is more important than what, because the what is inside here, uh, inside your brain or in, in your memory, um, and then continually broadening the, the circle of um, transmission. 
So when you have to transmit it more and more, that's January, and not only for the Bene Beneventan sources, also for the Aquitanian and others, maybe uh, in that process, maybe it becomes much more important this what, so uh, melodies and not the fine things of rhythmical things, liquid senses and all that, which is much more uh, something very, well, not individual to one person, but individual to uh, to the yeah. community. So, uh, I mean, I'm I'm so sorry, but I think I was a little bit too optimistic about time uh, for time. So, why don't we leave the answer to the chat, maybe to the space of the chat, or maybe email? Uh, but we really need to get to the next paper. I apologize for that. So, the next paper is our uh, next presenter is. But thank you, Julio, and everybody can applaud silently. Uh, so the next. Next presenter is uh, uh, Miriam 